five people are running to fill two seats of the state capitol. With no incumbent candidates, seat Lolly Joanna Decker, Janae Capella, and Michael Last are competing for votes for the Hawaii Island District 5 House seat. And on Oahu, can Republican incumbent Val Okimoto hold off her Democratic challenger Trish Lachika in the fight for the District 36 House seat? Tonight's live broadcast and live stream of Election 2020 on Insights on PBS Hawaii start now. Aloha and welcome to Insights on PBS Hawaii. I'm Laurie Yamada. Well, every two years, all 51 seats in the State House of Representatives comes up for election. Tonight, we're going to take a closer look at two of this year's races. District 36 on Oahu pits incumbent Val Okimoto against challenger Trish Lachika, who advanced from the primary. But first, the three candidates vying for the Hawaii Island District 5 seat after Representative Richard Keeg Cregan decided not to run for re-election. As always, we look forward to your participation in tonight's show. You can email, call, or tweet your questions, and you'll find a live stream of this program at pbshawaii.org and the PBS Hawaii Facebook page. All right, now to the candidates from Hawaii Island appearing via the Internet. House District 5 covers Na'alehu, Ocean View, Captain Cook, Kiala Kekua, and Kailua Kona. Sitlali Johanna Decker is from the Aloha Aina Party. She was born and raised in Texas. She moved to Hawaii along with her husband, who is from here. Michael Last represents the Libertarian Party. He served in the armed forces and is a retired electrical engineering consultant. And Democrat Janae Capella won her primary race to advance to the general election. She was born in Kona and was raised on a coffee farm in Captain Cook. Thank you all for being here. All right, let's get right to these questions because time is tight. Let's start with uh, you, Ms. Uh, Capella, and then to you, Mr. Last. You've both run for this office before, uh, Ms. Capella. Why run again? Thank you so much for that question. Hello, everyone. My name is Janae Capella. I am excited to be running again and grateful to be the Democratic candidate um, for State House District 5. I am running again because I truly believe that it's time to deliver hope to those who need it most. I ran in 2018. Um, because I felt that our community was not just had bad leadership, but had a complete lack of leadership entirely. And I believe that we need a new vision for our community that puts people's needs before corporate greed. I live in, in a high poverty district where infrastructure is dilapidated, economic opportunity is scarce, schools are poorly funded, and access to basic needs like medical and mental health services or reproductive care are extremely hard to obtain. Some portions of the district even lack running water. So we need to make sure that we are putting people back at the heart of our politics, building truly affordable housing for working families, not luxury homes for millionaires. We need to make sure that we are protecting the coffee and macadamia nut farmers in our district that truly grow some of our state's most iconic crops. Um, and then as climate change is coming to threaten our shores, it's time to create a Green New Deal for our state and invest heavily in clean energy and good paying green jobs. Now, more than ever in the middle of a pandemic, People deserve a living wage of at least $17 per hour, at least $17 per hour so that people aren't struggling to make ends meet. And as our pandemic has shown, we absolutely must need paid sick leave, family leave, single payer health care so that people don't have to choose between earning a paycheck or putting food on the table or caring for their keiki and their kukuna. It's time to deliver the schools that our keiki deserve so that students can become the medical innovators of tomorrow and the leaders that we need in our communities. So for me, I'm running because I truly believe that we need a better Hawaii, one that works for all of us, not just for the wealthy and the elite. All right, thanks you, uh, Ms. Capella. All right, uh, to you, Mr. Lass, why are you running again? Well, you know, I think the people of Hawaii need a better choice than what they've been picking all along. I'm just totally bewildered by why people continue to put the Democratic Party or the Republican Party to a, less, a lesser degree in these offices. I'm a libertarian. I believe that as an individual, you have the right, now this might shock people, but as an, an adult, you have the right to do whatever you want with your own personal property, provided you don't infringe on the person or property of a non-consenting other adult. End of story. That is basically why I'm running. A few, like I'm, I'm all in favor of gambling in Hawaii. I hate gambling. <clears throat> it's stupid. But if people want to play, 
Who's to say that they can't? This bothers me terrifically. Same with smoking. I don't smoke. I think it's terrible. But why do you have to be 21? Or our previous House of Representative member said he wanted to make it to be 100 until you can buy cigarettes. I say that's a good idea, providing you can get your parents' consent when you're 100. Anyway, no, I think that a person can do whatever the heck they want with their own personal property, provided they don't infringe on the personal property of a non-consenting other adult. That's it. Thank you, Mr. Lass. And to you, uh, Ms. Decker, why did you decide to run for political office? Um, I decided to run because um, I had heard of a lot of the problems um, through my husband and my husband's family. And then having moved here and experienced it for myself, uh, I, I decided um, since I had done the research to see where these problems were coming from and I found the solutions and they're already in legislation, it's just people don't um, know that it's there. I feel I would be um, good for the people to help point out where the changes need to happen and how we can implement it and just use my technical skills to um, solve these problems. All right, thanks, Ms. Decker. All right, let's let's get to to COVID. So top of mind for everyone. Uh, right now, um, after Oahu, Hawaii Island having the highest number of COVID cases, outbreaks in two care home facilities, University of Nations in Kona. Um, I'm going to start with you, Mr. Last. What more do you think needs to be done to stop the spread of the virus? I think people have to take responsibility. You, if the government says you have to wear a mask. If you don't want to, you don't have to. Just don't leave your house. It's as simple as that. And I have no, no problem with wearing masks. It should be up to the merchant, the, prop, the merchant, the store owner. If they demand that you wear a mask, well, you have to wear it or else you don't get admitted. Same thing like a shirt or pants. If the merchant says you have to wear pants, if you don't, you don't go in. That's as simple as it can make it. All right, thank you, Mr. Lass. And to Ms. Capella, your thoughts on what more needs to be done, um, if you think there needs to be more to be done to stop the spread of the virus. Absolutely. Thank you for that question. I definitely think that there's more that needs to be done. Um, this question is incredibly personal to me because I am a coronavirus survivor. I don't think that our state's leaders have handled the response to the pandemic effectively at all. At times, I think communication that's come from the governor's office has been confusing and in conflict with directives from county mayor's offices. Um, additionally, I believe that banking CARES Act funds and other relief funds was a huge mistake given that Hawaii's people need immediate assistance and we still continue to need assistance. Um, if I was in charge of our state's pandemic response, there are a number of things that I would have done differently. To begin, I would have ensured that a more coordinated communication system um, was in place so that the information that is received by the public was more clear and more actionable. And additionally, I would have suspended rent and mortgage payments um, until the economic crisis had passed. Moreover, I think that I would have immediately devoted all available resources to the Department of Labor to handle incoming unemployment claims. And we need to continue to do so, making sure that we are enabling people who have lost their jobs to be able to receive benefits in a timely manner. Our unemployment system has been completely overwhelmed by requests for assistance and needs to be fully modernized. Since unemployment benefits are set to run out at the end of the year as well, um, we also need to make sure that we are raising revenue to continue to fund enhanced benefits. The pandemic has shown just how fragile our economy is when workers are unable to thrive. So we need to make sure um, that we are seriously considering instituting a universal basic income program, which has been um, brought up at the state legislature before for our most vulnerable residents to ensure their ability to meet their basic needs. And finally, I think that we need to devote additional resources to food security, small business assistance, and financial aid for immigrants who are unable to obtain federal stimulus funding, and also making sure that we're funding our own public health system. Ultimately, the pandemic has revealed decades of neglect towards our public institutions. We need to fully fund and rebuild them so that we're ready to respond to any type of crisis situation whenever they occur in the future. All right, thank you, Ms. Capella. And to you, uh, Ms. Decker. I agree that um, this pandemic has exposed a lot of the um, um, lack that the state has had in, in the past. Um, things that haven't been taken care of, like the medical system. And um, I think 
that the role of the government is to provide the information like now, um, provide accurate information, but I don't think um, the government should be imposing mandatory restrictions on people because um, there's that one saying that the road to hell was paved with good intentions and that's where I feel we're going right now. All right, thanks, Ms. Decker. Let's let's turn to this question um, about public schools, uh, some distance learning or some in person. Do you think, and we'll start with you, Ms. Capella, do you think Hawaii County public schools should continue distance learning or return to in person instruction? Thank you for that question. I I do not. Um, you know, I think that our public school system has faced major challenges because of this pandemic. Teachers and students have had to adapt to this virtual learning environment that has been very, very difficult. Um, schools have continued to lack the resources that they need in order to make, maintain campus safety. And in my district, many families don't have access to the digital tools or the broadband necessary that is needed in order to access remote learning. Um, I think to me, this is a matter of equity and funding. It is absolutely critical that we increase funding for public education. Um, even before the pandemic occurred, sorry, there's dogs barking, um, Hawaii spends the lowest amount of combined state and county tax dollars on education of any state in the entire nation. We need to make sure that we're changing that. Um, and that's the best way that we can ensure and give our students the tools that they need to make sure that they're succeeding. Additionally, the pandemic is threatening to increase our state's chronic teacher shortage, which is a big fear for me here in District 5. Three of the five schools experiencing the worst teacher shortage in the entire state are located in West Hawaii. And that's right here in the district that we're talking about. Um, Hawaii's teacher salaries are the lowest in the nation when you adjust for the cost of living, which only makes it harder to recruit and retain qualified teachers. Oh. And finally, the pandemic has also revealed that um, the mistake of continuing to rely on standardized tests and outside contractors to drive our education system. You mentioned Acellus, and I think the controversy over the Acellus online learning program, which has found to be, which has been found to be racist, sexist, historically inaccurate, ultimately results from our state's reliance on private corporations um, to create curriculum for and learning content for our schools. So I think that we really need to empower teachers right now right, um, and help get make sure that our classrooms are safe, that teachers feel safe, um, and do everything that we can to okay. find a better program for our students. All right, thank you. And to you, uh, Ms. Decker. I think we can, we can take advantage of what's happened and fully redesign the education system where we do incorporate um, remote learning and in class and even expanding to using um, parks, uh, local parks to, to teach and to teach um, life skills like like growing food and, and harvesting water and different techniques that will um, help with our self-sustainability. Self and I think that we're not tapping into our greatest resource of teachers here, which is all the people in the community who have life experience and different trades and just years of accumulated knowledge that we have in each community. And um, maybe we can also um, change the unemployment system by employing the unemployed of these skilled laborers to teach their knowledge to the next generation. And that way it, it becomes a, a working cycle instead of just like dead ends in education and in unemployment. And, and to you, Mr. Last, Hawaii Public Schools, do you feel they should continue distance learning or return to in-person instruction? Uh, this is something I really don't have any firsthand knowledge about. I, my children are all are grown already, they're out. Um, I, I think it's a very serious problem we have, but then you also have to weigh the, the benefits of having better teachers with the, with the drawbacks. Where are we going to get the money from? You want to tax the people more? You can't do that. We're already, <laughs> we're over budget already this year. It's, it seems that's ridiculous. Now, I think, I, I'm sorry to say, but I have never been in this situation and neither has any of us before, where you don't have enough resources to teach the children. So they have to do remote learning, but it's, it's so unfortunate. But then again, to put them into class, they have that, that challenge also. So 
I, I don't really know, except that with the funds we have, we have to make better choices with what we decide to do. All right, thank you, Mr. Lass. All right, we're going to turn to a, a question that came in from a viewer. This is from Chris. And these are some um, kind of specific issues, I think, that are or, or pretty notable issues on the Big Island. And, and Ms., uh, Mrs. Decker, we're going to start with you on this question. So Chris asks, what would you do about the teen vaping epidemic on Hawaii Island? Hmm. I think... That is something parents should be dealing with, not really the state. Um, if, I mean, unless you're 18 and over, in my opinion, 18 and over, because in Texas, that was the, the age, it wasn't 21. But I really think it's a personal choice from that point on of adulthood. And I think um, we should continue with educating through commercials, like the, the damage and the harm that it can do, but it really is a personal choice. And I think, um, we need to make sure that we're walking a path where we're not violating people's rights, but we are informing people and it is up to each adult what choice that they make. And to you, Mr. Last. Well, you know, again, it goes back to individual freedom. You know, um, when I, I say that the law now is you have to be 21 to purchase cigarettes. And I asked my I asked my legislature, how come it has to be 21? Well, they're immature at 18, 19, and 20. I said, but you gave them the right to vote at 18. So there's a, there's a, this, there's a disparity about, about that. And I, I agree that it should be up to the parents because they have to get it. They have to get the money somewhere for the cigarette. And if they, if they want to take it, if they're 18 or older, well, that's a toss of subject because 18, I think they're adults. Other people don't think they are. And at 18, you can make your own decisions, but you have to live with the consequences. That, All right. Thank you, funny. Mr. Lass. And to you, Ms. Capella. Uh, thank you for this question. And thank you, Chris. Um, I, you know, teen vaping is an incredibly huge issue, especially here in the district. Uh, Konawana High School and elementary school have both been victims. Our students there have really suffered um, from, from vaping. Um, Konawana High School had such a bad teen vaping problem that a couple of years ago they had to send out, the, st the school staff had to send out a letter warning parents about um, the issue of teen vaping. The problem is that cigarette companies are targeting youth with flavored tobacco products. So, and that's what, that's what vaping is and that's what makes it so enticing. So we need to make sure that we're banning um, these flavored tobacco products, because at the end of the day, it's really just a target um, on our youth. And it's not acceptable because every single child needs the opportunity to thrive without being targeted by some predatory company that just wants to just wants to hurt our, our youth and um, and endanger their health and their welfare. So I truly support a ban on um, flavored e-cigarette products. All right. Thank you, Ms. Kamala. We're going to start again with you on this one, uh, uh, Ms. Uh... Um, Decker, this is about the 30 meter telescope, obviously a um, uh, big issue for many, many years on the Big Island. Uh, do you feel the 30 meter telescope should be constructed? Why or why not? I don't think so for two reasons. First reason is I, the people have already spoken and it's not just like a handful of people who've said no. There's been thousands of people up on the Mauna that have said no. And if we're going to keep ignoring them, then we're, we're pretty much ignoring the people that we're supposed to be representing. Um, the second reason is there's already other telescopes up there. So it's not like this is the first one ever. And having another one up there when Spain is willing to take one, like just let Spain have it. People here have already said no. So that's that's my opinion. Like I don't really have any feelings for or against it, but clearly people don't want it. So it's like no means no, you know? All right, and Ms. Capella, to you. Absolutely. So I'm running to be the very first Native Hawaiian elected to the State House from my district. I strongly oppose building TMT on Mauna Kea. We have to remember that Hawaii is a state that is built on stolen lands and broken dreams. And I fully believe that we need to keep Hawaiian lands in Hawaiian hands and fulfill our commitment to Hawaii's indigenous people. The demonstrations on, top of, on, on TMT didn't arise in a vacuum. 
Instead, they represent over a century of the Hawaiian people being dispossessed in their own homeland. Hawaiians continue to rank at the bottom of public health, education, and socioeconomic measures for our state. There is a reason for that. And the reason is that Hawaiians are still being treated as an occupied people, given little support in our fight for our own self-determination. For example, today, Hawaiians receive $15 million. That's less than 4% of public trust revenue. Yet, they are owed at least 78.8 million or 20% of money generated on public trust lands. Our nation is currently facing a legacy of, of systemic racism. When it comes to addressing institutional racism here in Hawaii, ensuring that Hawaiians receive the money that they're owed is the very, very least that our state can do. And it's long overdue. And I'm committed to ensuring that that, get, that, that gets done. Mauna Kea is our most sacred space in Hawaiian culture. TMT is the pinnacle of a long struggle for, constitution, for cultural restoration. And I applaud the work of scientists, what they're doing all across our state. And the pandemic has shown just how critical science is in order to, um, in order to have the public interest represented and um, preserved. But TMT is not about science. It's not just about that. It's about profit for corporations that are invested in this project. Um, we cannot and should not permit the desecration of Hawaiian lands in the pursuit of profit. Non-resident corporations like Alexander and Baldwin and TMT's foreign investors took control of the islands in the 19th century, and they still control Hawaii today. Okay. And when we take, and when they take our land, then they take our power. So for me, as a young Native Hawaiian woman, hoping to encourage other Native youth to be leaders in their own communities as well, I think that it is time that we take our power back, and it starts by something like TMT. All right, thank you, Ms. Kapal, and and to you, to you, Mr. Last, your um, stance on the 30 meter telescope. Well, I'm in opposition to both my opponents. I believe that it should be built. I'm a man of science. And I think without this science, uh, true, Spain wants it. But the, all the people who are involved with astronomy believe that Mauna Kea is the best place on Earth for observing the stars. And you know, they claim that it's Hawaiian land. Well, so was America before. <laughs> Christopher Columbus came here, and what did we do? We took over it, and everybody seems to be not thriving, but doing well. But Hawaii is, this just, this just occurred before my lifetime. I've only been in Hawaii a short time. I've only lived here since 1992, which amazes me that there is so much things that can be done with science. But yet, you know, I, I also question the fact that I think the majority of the people here in Hawaii are for the TMT. Absolutely. Absolutely. That's what I hear. Because just there was a few hundred people on the mountain. That doesn't mean anything. It means how many people who pay, who are taxed here, actually want it. And I would love to see that come to a referendum. All right, thank you, Mr. Lass. We, we got time for one more question, and I think this is very timely with the election coming up in just a couple of weeks. So we're gonna start with um, with you, Mr. Lass, on this one, actually. Um, this has to do with mail-in election, the new mail-in election. There are only two voter service centers and another four places of dis deposit on all of Hawaii Island for those wanting to drop off ballots in person. Should there be more with the possibility of slowdowns at the post office? You know, I mailed my ballot in already. I hate to say it because with this, with this uh, forum this evening, I, I, I'm not well informed to see what the other people's positions are. But everybody has access to the post office, everybody. And, you know, I, I really like to vote in person because what happens if my candidate who I voted for suffers major physical problems, medical problems, after I mailed in the ballot and before election day, I had no recourse. So I, I, I think there's a big mistake by doing mail-in, but again, the, the, the state has established that, so I'll live with it. I think everybody has access to a mailbox All and right. uh, even me to get to my closest place to drop off a I, um, my ballot. I need to move to on. Thank you. About 14 miles. Thank you, Dr. L I need to move on because I need to give you everybody one minute because we've got less than two oh, minutes sorry. left. So to Ms. Capella, to you.
Can you hear me, Ms. Capella? Oh, yes. Sorry, it's saying that my internet is it's unstable. It's okay. We got about 30 but, um, seconds you now. Uh, for you. So um, quickly, um, your, your, whether or not there should be uh, more uh, areas to place your ballots for the possibility of slowdowns at the post office. Absolutely. I think it's incredibly important to make sure that we increase voter access, especially in rural communities like District 5. Um, the, more, the more ballot boxes that we can put out, um, the more access we have. Um, I do support mail-in voting. I think that it's fantastic and it's really done a great job of increasing our voter turnout already. So just make sure you get out and vote. You can, if you want to vote in person, go to the two voter stations in our district or um, on our island. And for us here in Kona, it is the West Hawaii Civic Center. So definitely go and do that. Get your ballot in and make your voice heard. And about 30 seconds to you, Ms. Decker. I think there is um, there should be more um, places to vote in person and more places to drop off your your ballot. And I think um, um, there is just more room for improvement all around. And I'm pretty sure by the next election, we'll have all the details ironed out, hopefully. All right. We want to thank the candidates for State House District 5, Democrat Janae Capella, Libertarian Michael Last, and Sitlahi Johanna Decker from the Aloha Aina Party. All right, we'll be back, but first a hikino story from a school in our next featured district, Mililani Middle. Mililani Middle School has a unique tradition. Every year, the blue track sixth graders contribute to the Peace Garden. They paint rocks that symbolize peace in honor of the World War II veterans. In the year 2000, the sixth grade teachers here at Mililani Middle School decided to start the Peace Garden. It is located right outside the sixth grade building. What we wanted for the kids was something that they could connect to because our, our mission was making connections. We needed the children to understand that war is not fun, that every freedom we have today, we owe to someone else's sacrifice. I learned that many people have their own perspectives of what peace is to them and I also learned my own perspective of what peace to me is. This symbolizes peace to me because my name means heavenly ocean and the blue angel represents that. So I made this rock when I was in sixth grade and I'm an eighth grader and it still brings peace to me because of its serene beauty and it reminds me that life is beautiful. The veterans of the 100th Battalion came and talked to the students to share their experiences and lessons learned from World War II. But war is not a good place because, <laughs> you know, when you see people lost their arm, some of them got their nose shot off, they lost their leg, lost their arm. And, you know, a lot of them, you don't want to see them dead. We feel that the veterans of, of World War II are so um, important and valuable. And so to, for us, it's kind of a way to pay tribute to them and the sacrifices that they made. And hopefully for the students, it has that same significance also. I remember a few years back, one of our um, parents coming to the peace ceremony. And when we excused the parents to come up to the building to view the projects from the students, um, this one military f um, father, going right up to the vet and he, he fell to his knees and he just was, he was just sobbing and, and, you know, trying to tell the veteran, uh, you know, how much she had appreciated him and how much he thanked him for all, all that he had done for them. And it, everybody that was in that area, all the teachers, we were just all in tears because we just didn't expect that. Along with painting rocks, the students also fold paper cranes. This was inspired by the book Sadako and the Thousand Paper Cranes. In December of 2012, Mrs. Coloma took the paper cranes that the students made to the Hiroshima Memorial in Japan. Just like Sadako, the students fold these paper cranes with one wish, a wish for peace. We are so lucky to have this garden here at our school. It's our memorial to all the veterans who fought in the war. As each student lays down their rock, they leave behind their image of peace. Each rock tells a different story of what peace means to someone. From Mililani Middle School, this is Caitlin Alvior for Hiki No. Welcome back now to the District 36 State House race, which covers Mililani Malka and Mililani. The incumbent for this seat is Republican Val Okamoto. Born and raised on Kauai, she is a graduate of Kauai High School and Brigham Young University, Hawaii. She's lived in Mililani for more than 16 years. Trying to unseat her is Democrat Trish Lachika, 
After an unsuccessful bid in 2018, she won her primary race this year. She is a public health advocate and serves on the Mililani Neighborhood Board. Thank you so much to both of you for being here. Thank you. All right, let's get right to it. And uh, we're going to start actually with a viewer question. And Ms. Lachiga, we'll start with you. This is from Kay. She says, what have you been doing since the pandemic to help working families? And what will you do for families during the legislative session? Yeah, well, first, thanks on PBS for having me here. Thanks, Lara. Thanks for the question. Um, you know, I was very proud of the fact that early on, back in February, um, I had come from our trip to the Philippines where um, our family is and where I'm from. And I noticed that there was a lack of just um, protections at the airport um, screening. And so I immediately got our Mililani disaster preparedness team together, um, which convenes the central Oahu community. And I was already um, talking to them about social distancing, about um, hand sa sanitizing and also wearing of masks. Um, so we got the message out early. Um, we also put early on put together um, a, our, all the resources around COVID-19 um, for our communities and for our families. Um, there's a lot of confusion with the orders with March and the early shutdown. And so we wanted to make sure that um, people understood what was happening and what businesses remained open and shut down. And I'm also proud of the fact that when I saw the uh, DOE list of grab and go meals um, for our students, there was, Mililani was not on that list. So I contacted Senator Kidani, um, and after um, having a conversation with her, we were able to get Kipapa Elementary on that list. Um, uh, finally, um, there's just a lot of um, volunteers, you know, and just support. We were able to bring together dozens of Mililani um, community members to put together um, face shields um, for our community, uh, our frontline workers. Um, and then tomorrow, again, uh, Mililani residents and I are gonna be at the Aloha Stadium distributing um, 50 pound food boxes um, for our hospitality workers in need. All right, thank you. And to you, Representative Okimoto. Thank you. You know, again, thank you, PBS, for having me on and having us on the show too, so that we can express our um, views and our, our, our issues with our voters. So this is a different year for me. I was in the state legislature during COVID. And so unlike, you know, my previous first session in 2019, we were dealing with the pandemic while still trying to pass the state budget. So there were many things that were happening at the same time with the schools being shut down. We still in the legislature passing the budget. One thing that I'm very you know, proud of is the fact that I was able to continue to reach out to our schools. I was also, I'm grateful you know, for um, the efforts that were put into the grab and go. I was able to support that also. I reached out to Dr. Kishimoto, the DOE. I reached out to even our schools and our principals and supported that. I even was able to go down and volunteer at the schools as well as with the food bank, food bank distribution. But one thing that I'm really proud about that doesn't go, um, you know, we don't tout about is that my office alone was able to help nearly 100 unemployment and PUA claims that were falling short. And some of our residents had issues for months. They were not able to get their, their claims. And so that's something that you know, as, as one representative with one person working in my office as a full-time staff, we're able to do. But reaching out to the schools, I was also able to reach out to the small businesses um, in, our, in our community who have been suffering during this extended, um, you know, COVID pandemic and the shutdowns that were mandated by the government. All right, thank you, Representative. Let's turn to this other, another question that's related to what's happening with COVID. And this has to do with, uh, these are actually, I'm gonna kind of combine these questions having to do with um, the industry of tourism, um, the hit that it took, the impact that it has because it's so prominent in our state, and whether or not we need to start reinvesting in other ways in the economy. And related to that, ideas on di possibly diversifying the job market for, in particular, for Hawaii's unemployed right now. Right. You know, I was able to be um, on the tourism committee during my first two sessions in the legislature and I saw the importance of it. I've always been a supporter of tourism. And so when COVID hit, that was a hard thing for us to see that, you know, and we realized how, how fragile our economy is. I still support the tourism industry, but I do realize that we need to diversify our economy. That being said, you know, there's lots of things that are thrown out, um, intensifying the agriculture um, industry and other things. That, and I think that's very important, but we also need to be realistic. Um, we are such a a hard state for local businesses to, to, to thrive in. So for me, I would suggest really looking into how we can motivate and perpetuate and um, have a better uh, business friendly environment here, whether it's through you know, tax credits or what we can do to, to instill a better environment for our business industry. But definitely looking to the agriculture, it's a, it's a fragile industry as well. But I have always been a supporter of opening up and doing things wisely and in that sense you know the economy is is necessary for us to have our health resources that we need at this time all right thank you representative and to you uh miss lachica 
Yes, you know, absolutely. Um, COVID-19 has devastated our economy. It's been seven months and um, our hospitality industry is, su is suffering. Um, our workers, um, our working families are still struggling. And I do believe that Hawaii, we have a, an opportunity right now to really reimagine um, and, and reimagine how we, we can move away from our re reliance on tourism. It's not to replace tourism. It's um, looking at how our tourism can work better for our communities, um, for our environment, and diversifying our economy. I support um, food security, food resiliency, um, as Ms. Okimoto said. But you know, my, my husband works in tech. Um, I also want to look at um, you know in, uh, investing in competitive industries that our youth um, will get excited about, that will have higher paying jobs, um, whether it's arts and film, whether it's tech, um, whether it's clean energy. But right now we have to acknowledge that COVID-19 is not gonna go away anytime soon. So my immediate priority is to ensure that we have a Kama'aina economy that protects the health and well-being of our workers, that um, our workers feel protected. So I want to see paid family leave pass um, I want to make sure that there's childcare access. I talk to our Mililani constituents every day, um, and it's so hard right now with kids at home and families um, unable to um, file childcare. Um, and, and finally, I really want to work with communities to build a plan that keeps, um, you know, gets this virus under control and keeps it away from our communities. All right, thank you. Uh, I'm gonna start with you on this one. And this is uh, a question really to not just jobs, but to paychecks mm -hmm. and having to do with teachers. So uh, this is a question from Brandon in Mililani Mauka. He's saying, do you support Governor Ige's furlough proposal on teachers and state workers, or will you commit tonight to finding additional funding for state workers' salaries if elected? Um, thank you, Brandon, for that question. Um, I am opposed to furloughs and pay cuts coming at a time when our frontline workers and our essential workers are working so hard to keep our um, families and residents safe, when they're working um, uh, so hard to keep our government running, the last thing we want is to tell these people that you're gonna lose 10% or 20% of your paycheck, that you're gonna lose your benefits. Um, I'm committed to doing everything that I can to look for revenue options, to look for the money, to keep our workers employed um, and to protect jobs and benefits. Um, I think instead of across the board cuts, um, what we really need to do is to empower our administrative leaders. We have so many talented um, people who work in our departments that I work with um, in my capacity um, who have the ability to, ability to look at how we can um, you know, be creative in um, saving costs um, and, 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 you know, and move away from, from cuts and furloughs. And so I'm, I'm fully committed to ensuring that um, our, our workers and their wages are protected. And to you. Thank you. You know, one um, maybe secret that maybe many don't know, I actually was a furloughed employee. I was a teacher during furlough Fridays. And so I know firsthand how it feels to have your job and your pay affected by the budget cuts that the government needs to do. I cannot say either way. You know, I, I think it's important for us to realize that moving forward, COVID is going to be with us, and we have some hard decisions that have to be made. It's really easy to promise everything but not have any backing of how we're going to fund it. So while I, I, you know, I've always been in support of the teachers, and I actually voted in favor of SB 2488, which was the pay increases for the teachers before COVID. I know that moving forward, we're going to need leaders who are willing to make the tough decisions. So I will fight hard to not make that happen. However, I realize that moving forward, we need to make tough decisions. We are in a $2 billion budget deficit at this time. And with the economy just barely opening up, we're going to need legislators who are willing to work with transparency, work across the aisle, and make those hard decisions, especially fiscal responsible, responsible decisions. And I, I'm a teacher by trade. I also have lots of friends and um, family who are teachers and educators, principals in the system, and they understand. They're not naive to thinking that this, is, this may be a reality for them. But definitely, you know, when we can talk about the overall health of our economy, that's what we need to figure out. So thank you for asking that question. I, I know firsthand, I, I experienced the furlough Fridays. And so here's another question really just impacting families uh, here, and this is uh, having to do with housing and affordable housing. And I'm gonna start with you, Representative Okamoto. New housing developments, big time, being built in central Oahu there. Uh, do you feel there's enough affordable housing though 
in your district. And how is that development affecting traffic as well? I mean, it's tied, it's kind of hard it's to like, separate it's a, the two issues. Yeah, thank you for asking that question. You know, in, in our district, there aren't, they are not building any more homes. And whenever I hear the, the buzzword affordable housing, I kind of, I, I cringe a little bit because affordable is not what we, the numbers that we're seeing. They are having, there's a development coming up that's, that is near our district that will affect the traffic. I do feel that we need to, and one thing I think, I, one of the reasons I ran two years ago is because I have two young daughters. I'm a local kid born and raised on the island of Kauai. My parents are still there. They're hardworking, they're humble. And I think they wanted me to leave 